We at Indiana Center for Middle East Peace uh, are delighted to be hosting uh, Dr. Goldbarg Bashi uh, to Fort Wayne for her presentation, The Power of Children's Literature, P is for Palestine, and more. Goldbarg, welcome. Thank you. you. You were born in Iran, raised in Sweden, educated in the UK and US. Tell us a little bit about what you've learned about life and about your work from this cosmopolitan life that you've led, a marriage uh, between East and West. Right. Well, um, first of all, thank you so much for having me. Uh, and um, it's, it's, I'm, I'm delighted to be uh, among friends and uh, being taken care of um, so beautifully. So thank you so much, first of all. Um, I mean, yes, I, uh, I was born in Iran uh, to a family of book lovers, academics and, and such. So, um, and then the move to Sweden uh, was traumatic, but, you know, we learned a lot, got to know children from other countries, you know, other refugee ch uh, children that I would have never had the opportunity had we stayed in Iran. It made me very aware of, of issues of racism because I became a target of racial, you know, abuse in Sweden as an Iranian. So that made me aware of racial um, injustice, say in Iran or in the West Asian. I don't call it the Middle East. I call it West Asia. Um, so definitely, my life experiences have had a huge role in in who I am today as a intersectional, anti-racist, anti-war feminist. So I've experienced war, Iran-Iraq war. Um, you know, as a, as a young adult, you know, the, after 9-11 and all of those things. So traveling, my, my academic training, um, all, all of these things have sort of made me who I am today. And I see myself as a citizen of the world. And I don't see it as East and West, really. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but uh, yeah, I, I hope that that is a sufficient answer. Yeah. yeah. A citizen of the world, would, would that in these days, more of us would think of ourselves that way? You know, we have a wonderful uh, Iranian poet uh, named uh, Nima Yushij. Uh, he has a poem um, where he says that, you know, he's a citizen of the world. And he wrote it in the 19... I think 30s or so. So I come from that literary tradition and also from that culture where um, my parents were socialists and uh, they truly at the time in, in the 60s and 70s, you know, they were part of the, the, the sort of global struggle, uh, you know, anti-Vietnam War. So that's the kind of background I come from. I don't come from this ultra-nationalistic uh, uh, place. So yes, absolutely. Very Iranian. Um, and I celebrate Nuruz, you know, I go nuts over Yalda, our winter solstice, all these things. I love Christmas. Uh, but citizen of the world, yes, I, um, you know, of course, once you don't have a passport, say like Palestinian refugees, it is difficult to, to call yourself the citizen of the world. But when you do have the opportunity to travel, um, and you have the opportunity to, to become educated and uh, you allow yourself to meet people from various walks of life, then hopefully you can come to that place and then call yourself a citizen of the world and not allow people to tell you to go back to your country, that sort of a thing, you know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. It's, it's a struggle, but yes, um, you have to imagine it. And, and as they say, fake it until you make it, right? <laughs> they, 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 they use that term in filmmaking, I believe. So yeah, you, you, you fake it until you make it. And that, that being a citizen of the world is, is very much a struggle. You, it's something that you've got to every day kind of remind yourself because there are, as you said, forces that will tell you otherwise. Yeah. They will say, go back to your country, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> This is fascinating, and a number of people have asked me to ask you this question. Sure. So uh, in 2016, you were nominated by the U.S. toy industry. Uh, uh, Wonder Woman Award in the designer inventor category for advancing early childhood education through play 
for languages using the Arabic and Persian scripts, the Wonder Woman Award. Uh, it honors top female executives, thought leaders, entrepreneurs, and other change makers for their extraordinary accomplishments and impact within the toy licensing and entertainment industries. Uh, tell us a <laughs> tell us about uh, uh, what that is all about, and tell us about that experience. Well, it, um, for, first of all, I was just nominated. I didn't, yeah, know, I didn't uh, win the award. Under, under. I, <laughs> my uh, my com my competitors were, yeah, you know, I was competing with Disney and Hasbro and Lego, and that you know, so <laughs> I, there was no chance. So, but so I was very honored. Um, well, you know, I I'm an academic first and foremost, but I decided to leave the academy. I felt that. Uh, my energy, my knowledge, whatever, you know, whatever I have in me should be uh, used um, for, for children. And uh, I noticed that there weren't any woodblocks in Arabic and Persian. Um, there were at the time, I think, one brand of Arab, Arabic woodblocks, but they were no good. Not, a, not according to me. So together with a, a wonderful designer named Kurush Begpur, uh, he's an award-winning graphic designer. We uh, embarked on this project and created um, these beautiful woodblocks in Arabic and Persian, uh, handmade in Vermont, USA, from uh, eco-friendly sort of sustainable forests using Vermont sort of native techniques. And um, I think the reason why, perhaps one of the reasons I was nominated was that the fact that uh, we really poured our heart into into these blocks. So the blocks weren't just ABC blocks; they included lots more um, number shapes, colors, everything. Because wow. I want, I wanted, um, I didn't want families to have to buy multiple different sets or different things. I wanted you know everything in one. So there, there, there were gender, uh, you know, conscious, uh, conscious of race. For example, we had the, the five senses. So the hand was brown. The nose was sort of, you know, sort of more typical, say, Iranian uh, nose. So we, we paid attention to these things, and um, I, I was I was happy that that was recognized. And it was a lot. It was a wonderful experience uh, creating these blocks, and um, families who who bought them um, uh, were are still very happy. And I have promised them that they will last forever, unless uh, they do something terrible to them, like. Put a nail in it or something. Are they still available? No, we discontinued because I switched my attention to children's books. books. Yeah, it was too much of a hustle, so to speak, uh, to get the blocks out, and uh, I felt that again I needed to focus um, or shift my attention to, to something that would uh, would be more helpful. Uh, the blocks were um, w was, was great doing them, and I'm very proud of them, and they will remain. Uh, but uh, in order to really make them, uh, make it a viable sort of from a business perspective and, and doing it in an ethical way uh, was, was, was really hard. So I, I, uh, I, I gave myself, I think, two or three years to do that. And then when I felt like we had exhausted it, we moved on to the, to the books. You've been an outspoken advocate for anti-bullying measures incorporating ethical, earth-friendly, and gender race-conscious principles into not only the toy industry, but throughout the media and popular culture. In our increasingly fractured American society, uh, right, this is more important than ever. I mean, especially, I mean, it's always been present, but it's especially been, uh, you know, ramped up in, since uh, our previous president and just the, the fracturing of our country. Tell us more about your uh, your work in this area. Well, you're you're very generous. Um, I mean, the, the way you describe it, uh, I, I sound um, uh, incredible. Uh, so thank you. But mm -hmm. I, 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 I'm the I'm tiny little voice um, among millions of others uh, who, who are doing what we need to do, uh, basically putting our knowledge and energy where it's most needed. And uh, when you have hate crime against children who look for example, Chinese, you got to do something about it. Uh, when you have, um, you know, wars raging in, in regions, you need to uh, 
you either become a professor and teach those subjects, um, or you write children's books um, so that children can learn about um, other kids who look like them, or may not look like them, but it brings out their humanity. And what I've tried to do, and I think there, there comes the Swedish uh, thing, the part in me, is that to do it from an environmentally just perspective, because Sweden is really has been very good at that. Uh, you know, protecting the environment is, is has been a you know huge uh, goal for various governments in Sweden, regardless of, our, of of their politics. So, you know, whatever you do, do it properly. Do the research. Uh, if you're printing books, make sure the paper is coming from a sustainable you know forest. Um, just just do the right thing, and and that that's 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 it. You've written two children's books about Palestine. P is for Palestine, uh, a Palestine alphabet book, and Counting Up the Olive Tree, a Palestine number book. You mentioned to me uh, yesterday that they came from your experience as a refugee in Sweden and connecting with Palestinian refugees. Uh, so say a word about that, but also you've mentioned that these are just the first two right, right. in a series uh, that you're doing uh, about uh, a series of children's books about Palestine. Yes. Uh, so say a word about that too. Well, thank you. Yes, um, you know, I once I decided to write children's books, I wanted to. Um, I, I realized that there were there were no books at the time in in the English language for preschool and early sort of you know elementary school children about Palestine in the English language or any language other than Arabic. Now it's important to mention that Palestinian children's literature in Arabic is glorious. So this has to be mentioned. But as someone who lives in New York, who's a mother herself, um, the, the lack of diversity in children's literature was something that was really bothering me. And I, I, I would notice it in my, in my college students as well, whether they were from Palestine or wherever, and also those who were, had no connection to the region. So I began with Palestine because I felt at the time it was the most erased uh, country, place on earth and the US. And also um, you know, our foreign policy uh, very much uh, uh, is to the detriment of these people. Right, so I, uh, I decided to start, start with Palestine, inspired by Palestinian uh, authors and art, you know, artists themselves, and got the blessing of, of prominent Palestinians to do so. Uh, and so the idea is to publish a series to you know right the wrong that has has been done to Palestinian children in the American or European children's literary sort of industry. And but at the same time, I write other books that haven't been published. Um, you know, we've had COVID, all these con all kinds of things, and we have financial constraints, of course. Uh, but yes, so, you know, Syria, Afghanistan, Iran. Uh, so I call it sort of er erased, underrepresented, or misrepresented. And so I, and I've started with the region that I've, I'm from, and that I have an education in, so that I, you know, that I'm, that I'm best serving. Um, but but once I have done that, I want I want to you know write about children at the border, you know, at, uh, our, our southern border, uh, who are separated from their families. So um, that that's what it's all about. And 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 Palestine is yes. You mentioned the fact that I you know I, I met Palestinian children as a child myself in Sweden, as a refugee, and got to know their cause from a young age. So that really resonated with me because I thought that as an Iranian refugee kid, surely we were the most wretched. You know, you, you, is there, in, the Olymp in, the, in the oppression Olympics, so, so to speak, at the time, we're talking late 80s or so, you know, in my imagination, uh, Iran and what had happened um, to my family uh, and the war that had destroyed our home could surely there was nothing else that could 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 
the trumpet, so to speak. And then I met Palestinian children, and they told me their about story. about their uh, their experiences, and and I realized that, oh my God, at least we have a flag as Iranians. Some of us may not like it, but uh, we, we're a nation. We're registered. You know, we're recognized. We're we may be vilified. We may have all kinds of issues, but at least we have a nation. Palestine, my Palestinian friends don't. They do, but they're told they don't, and they've been kicked out of that. And so that has always been something that's been very, very close to my heart. Yeah. Well, let's let's uh, follow up on that. Uh, um, we just celebrated Nauru's uh, here with over a hundred of our recently relocated Afghan refugees in our community. You just recently celebrated Nauru's too. Of course. Um, and you were written a book um, in Persian about no ruse. So tell us what, what we need to know about no ruse in oh. your culture, and also tell us about your children's book that's going to be uh, translated into English very, very soon. You know, that book actually was written initially in English. Oh. Then I translated into Persian <laughs> because... I took a course um, uh, on how to write children's books because it's very different than academic writing. You'd be surprised. And uh, for different ages, it's a whole science. Uh, so I took a, a course at Columbia on how to write children's books. And, and we were taught by our professor to write about something that's very close to us. So I had an experience um, regarding saving this goldfish that is traditionally, you know, uh, we have it on our Noruz uh, table, and Noruz is a transnational celebration um, that, that is as Iranian as it is Afghan, as Kurdish, and is celebrated by peoples of Central Asia. It's, it hap you know, it's, 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 it's a very scientific one. We have an infographic. If you look it up, <laughs> Noruz is science, and it will tell you in English everything you need to know. So I will, I will give you the link. And uh, so... Because I can talk, it's like you know asking someone to talk about Christmas. Of course. Uh, yeah. So I can I can go on and on about it, but the 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 story, um, yeah, it's it's really a semi autobiographical story about myself wanting to save this fish because Noruz is about um, it's an ancient festival, uh, and it it celebrates the rebirth of of of, of Earth in the northern hemisphere and the coming of spring, and it happens on the moment of vernal equinox, hence the science. Uh, and all countries in the Northern Hemisphere recognize our New Year's Eve as a spring solstice. So in the American calendar, you will have, you know, the date will be there, spring solstice. And that's what I love about it, that, it's, it, that it is such a global thing. But we do have certain traditions, and the main one is that we have seven items that we put on a spread, it can be on the floor or on a table, that start with the letter S. Now there's a history to it, you know, and I'm not gonna, but there, there's wheat grass, it's everything that has to do with rebirth. So they're very symbolic things. But we also have uh, additional items that we have lent, for example, to Christianity, like painting, painted eggs uh, and, and, and so forth. But in, in the past sort of um, 100 or 200 years, a new tradition began with having a goldfish, a uh, beautiful, you know, goldfish. Um, and uh, I had issues with it because these fish would die. And they, the, 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 the word for fish in Persian is mahi. It's with letter M. So as a child, I always wondered, why do we have the mahi? you know, uh, on, on the spread, it's, it's, and, and they die. So, um, so it's an environmental story about a, this kid wanting to save the goldfish. And it ends with, you know, you, you gotta read it. <laughs> and uh, so, yes, it, it, was, it was launched in Iran. The Persian version of it was launched in Iran in 2019. The English version um, is ready to go into print I hope that it will, um, but you know, the world has been in turmoil, uh, all of us, a lot of projects have been delayed, but hopefully Good. You know, soon, soon. I, I want to get personal uh, for a moment uh, with you, and I'm, I, I'm risking doing that because you have 
been so open uh, in sharing. Um, we were going to host you, as you remember, uh, three years ago in 2019 when you were diagnosed with cancer. And the chemo and radiation prevented you from coming uh, then. Uh, and now you've been very open on Facebook and other <laughs> venues uh, about its recurrence. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what have you learned about yourself, uh, your, your role as a scholar, an activist, also your role as a mother, uh, as a woman, as a human being uh, from dealing with cancer? Well, thank you. Uh, yes, and thank you for bearing with, with me sharing all this, uh, you know, on social media. I, um, it's been a form of therapy for me, but also I have, I, I got a very rare cancer that um, a lot of people don't know about, which is the, the cancer of the appendix, and I felt the need to spread awareness about it. For example, Audrey Hepburn, the great actress, she died of it, and most people don't know. So um, the cancer of the appendix is something that those of us who have it um, are, are very willing to share information about it so that hopefully others will be diagnosed sooner because it's a kind of cancer that is detected sort of end late stage, hence the recurrence. Uh, mine was, was diagnosed very late. So that's why I've been sharing uh, uh, about it on, on, on social media. So two, two things there. Uh, what I've learned, I guess, is that Gosh, I can take pain, uh, <laughs> and I can, you know, and uh, that uh, life is worth living for, and that you will do anything basically to live, especially when you have children, because you've got to, even when it's really, really hard. Because there were moments where I was, you know, I can't do this anymore, and then I would look at my children, and also I would look at all the books that I need to publish. So two things here, really. As a mother, that I gotta do what I need to do, and then I realize all the everything that my my own mother has done for us. You know, during the Iran Iraq War, there was shortages of food, and I it had never occurred to me the things that my mother and my father did for us, and we never even realized really what it, how terrible things were. And so when COVID hit, I remember hoarding food, and I bought a freezer, and I was going through the chemo. And uh, so you go into that survival mode and then you appreciate what your parents have done for you and, and how much they have shielded you. Like, you know, the movie Life is Beautiful, uh, the Italian movie where the father is, is, is a Jewish Italian and he ends up in a, uh, in a camp, uh, extermination camp with his little boy, but he, he pretends that they're there for a game, right? That film really resonates uh, with me, and, you, you, and, and there are Palestinian um, you know, parents who will play games with their kids where there's bombardment, for example. They'll be like, oh, it's just fireworks, you know? So I, um, you, you, you'll do anything for your children. So uh, my, my kids were young at the time when I received it, so we talked about the appendix that it's not really a big deal, so they wouldn't get traumatized. Now that they've gotten older, obviously, they know more and about how advanced it is and everything. So, yeah, about the fact that you will you you, you do what you got to do because um, life is worth living, as hard as it is, and you realize how privileged you are despite everything that you're receiving incredible care. Uh, but I also, it made me become more vocal about the issue of universal health care in the United States. Yeah. So um, it was something that was always very close to my heart because I grew up with universal health care, both in Iran at the time. They no longer have universal health care, but they did up until I lived there. Uh, and they, they still have universal health care in Sweden and in Britain, the NHS. Um, so it was something that was always very close to my heart. So I became a vocal, and I remain a very vocal sort of advocate for universal health care. So when we had the elections, for example, um, I would go to chemo wearing my Bernie Sanders shirt. And the, the, <laughs> the nurses were like, you Bernie Sanders uh, mm -hmm. you know, people, you're very, very passionate, aren't you? Mm -hmm. And I said, passion, ma'am, has nothing to do with it. I can receive this chemo because I have private health insurance, 
right? Is it right? And so I would get into these discussions with the nurses. And uh, so that, that cancer has, has, that's what it's done for me. It's given you a platform. It's a given a new platform. A new platform, and really. And personal. I mean, it, it now comes not only in, from an intellectual space or a social justice space, but it comes, you're embodying this very... Absolutely. So I'm part of, for example, Facebook pages for my kind of cancer. And so when you have fundraisers uh, for someone who needs money for, for care, I will always go in and, and I will say, yes, you know, absolutely. But listen, we need to mobilize. We need to raise our voices. We need to vote for Bernie when, when it was the election. And uh, I was almost kicked out of one group. But um, and I would share statistics and, you know, and, and basically say that we as, uh, as, as patients uh, or survivors or whatever of, of cancer in particular, we, we need to be fighting for universal health care. Come on, everyone, you know? So, um, yeah, that, that, that's one of the things that the cancer helped me, I guess, raise my voice and, and, and to do it from, from a more kind of uh, entitled <laughs> perspective, like, I've been there, I know, sort of a thing, sure. yeah. You just returned uh, from Iran uh, a few weeks ago, and you were there for a while. Yes. We, of course, in our country have all these stereotypes, negative stereotypes I know. <laughs> of Iran. Uh, in just a, a, a brief period here, uh, what should we know? What would you like to tell us about Iran that we don't know? I would tell you to watch Anthony Bourdain, bless his soul, his program uh, where he traveled throughout the world. I would, I would urge everyone to watch the, his episode when he travels to Iran. He was a grumpy guy, right? He was very picky about food, and he would get angry and everything. And he went to Iran. And I would say, just watch that episode. It will tell you everything you need to know. So I, I, I don't want it because I don't want to take too much of your time. And I urge everyone to, you know, there is, there is a semi-consulate. We don't really have representation because the countries don't have diplomatic relations. But there is a, sort of a consulate type of place in Washington, D.C. Go there. Try to get a visa, tr travel there, and, and, and see for yourself that Iranians are ordinary people just like everyone else, and they're suffering under U.S.-led sanctions, and they're also suffering under domestic tyranny. So they're, they're, they're battling two, two, two issues at the same time. But it, it is an absolutely beautiful place. They're, despite everything that's happening, there are still film festivals. There's children's book festivals, book fairs, you know. So it's, it's still a thriving culture, despite... One of the Asian cultures uh, on the planet. Uh, among, I, you know, I, I would say among. Uh, and and uh, we owe that, you know, the, the idea of nation states sure. bother, bothers me, but uh, it is at the crossroad of, 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 you know, so much West Asia. So definitely, you know, and with the Noruz and everything, of course, absolutely, a very ancient has, history. But um, some of its most glorious gifts to the world are from the medieval time, you know, the, uh, the Islamic era with the science and astronomy and the poetry and all of that. So watch Anthony Bourdain's trip to Iran Go there, travel there, and you can contact me anytime and we can talk about how to drink Persian t Iranian tea properly. You know, you put this thing in the hole. You know, we, we, have, our, we have our peculiar ways that, um, for example, a lot of people would know about the Japanese, but they don't know about us. We, and I do that with my kids. I'll be like, well, the Japanese also take off their shoes when they enter the house. Uh, why it's a sign of respect, da 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 da, and so when you 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 put it together, you be like, well, the Japanese do it, we do it, but everybody else does it, and and so then then it becomes like, oh okay, so it's not this weird alien, like crazy thing that Fox News or even CNN has been showing us. Um, yeah. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you said about Anthony Bourdain in uh, Iran. Uh, because we often recommend uh, watching his uh, 
uh, his travel to Palestine. Absolutely, that, he, too, he does, that one too. He does Israel, but he, he doesn't do Israel and Palestine together as if they're not, as if they're the same. Right. He does uh, hit trip into the West Bank and the Palestine itself. Absolutely. So I'm glad to hear you say to watch Anthony Bourdain in Iran. Yes, and, and we'll uh, do that. his passing was, was a, a tremendous loss uh, for Iranians and pa Palestinians because, you know, the, we felt, and especially people who, who live uh, in these countries, felt that, you know, he went out of his way. And he risked a lot, you know. It's it's not an easy thing, you know, to convince CNN ex executives to let you go to these axes of evil kind of crazy <laughs> places, you know, where they behead you and they kill you and they you will, you will die, they will poison you, that sort of thing. So we 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 have a lot of admiration for him, but um, you know, and, and also just it's not a lot of the times. What happens is that you will have a what they call a V blogger um, from Sweden or something traveling to Iran and, and doing a video that's very positive. Um, that's great. But also watch, say, Iranian films and, and, and read stories. Um, but as a beginner, as a, for a beginner, that's who I recommend. I say watch Anthony Bourdain and then also watch Iranian cinema. Uh, of the 1990s in particular. Okay. It will blow you away. I have two more questions. Um, in your book, P is for Palestine, the passage that got you in trouble, at least one of them, was uh, I is for Intifada. Uh, you've spoken about this a little bit, uh, but uh, um, um, in, your, in some of your conversations, and I read some of your in other interviews, You've mentioned that it's a 71-year-old uh, term, it, longer, even longer, but it has a history really in, in contemporary consciousness um, uh, more recently uh, in the Palestinian context. Uh, it's resistance to occupation of a people's land, and then you reference it's like Native American resistance Absolutely. to white settlers, and you've also spoken about it in terms of the civil rights movement. So um, what do you want us to know? What else do you want us to know about intifada in yeah. the Palestinian context? Well, my book came under attack merely because it was the first book, merely because it had the, the word Palestine in it. And it was published in New York in 2017. People hadn't even read it. So the, um, and then they made uh, those who didn't like it and wanted banned and burned and me burned and all of that, had issue really with the fact that a book about Palestine with the word Palestine had been published and how dare you do that in our city. So there was this us versus them. Then uh, some made it about intifada. Intifada is an Arabic word that means rising up, uh, uh, resistance. And Palestinians have been doing this for over 70 years through all kinds of means uh, by calling themselves Palestinian. Um, telling their children the stories, holding on to the keys of their home. All of this is resistance. And so, um, you know, throughout um, U.S. mass media in particular, certain terms have come to mean terrible things, like, say, jihad, right? Um, I read an article about a man, the man who you cannot call his name in, at an airport, and his name is Jihad, right? So you have certain words, Arabic words, um, that, that take on these very negative connotations because they're constantly used with images of violence, right? And that is what has happened with the Palestinian Intifada that has been constantly shown with images of violence. And this is something that we saw in the Western film uh, sort of genre with John Wayne, right? Yeah. And and uh, and na the Native Americans, you don't see their faces. They're just shooting, and they're very violent. You don't you don't quite see why they're upset, and you also don't see their other types of resistance that are nonviolent. So, uh, anyone having an issue with intifada, I would say, you know, don't. It's part of Palestinian existence. And as a children's author who's writing a, the first book in English alphabet book, I had a responsibility to include it. And it, it you know, so um, you, it, 
if, if you, if, if as an author, a children's author, you were the first one to write about, say, um, se you know, racial segregation, and, uh, and, and you, you wouldn't mention um, Rosa Parks, for example, wouldn't that be irresponsible of you? You know, and, uh, w or, or you didn't mention Malcolm X, or wouldn't that, wouldn't that be irresponsible? You know? uh, so that was something that absolutely had to, to, to be part of the book. And um, so, yeah, it's, it's the reality of, of the Palestinian life, and it means rising up for what is right whether you're a kid or a grown up, and, and Palestinians have been doing it through cooking their meals and insisting that it is Palestinian, wearing their clothes, whether it's the kufiya or the thob with the tatris, calling it Palestinian, never forgetting the names of their towns and villages, even some that were demolished. Uh, and and uh, so all of that is intifada, and you have to have it in the book. And, and just simply remaining in the land, Instead of emigrating to the West, I mean, many of the folks would just remain and live their daily lives and thrive there. Uh, that's a form of uh, yeah, of yeah. I mean, there's nothing wrong with with migrating to, to 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 anywhere, but but yes, absolutely, remaining and and so you have now fifth, sixth generation Palestinians born in refugee camps, and they have remained in the refugee camps because it. They, they will not accept the fact that they yeah. were thrown out of their homes and their grandparents, some of them, were violently killed, you know, through genocidal means. I mean, there's no other way of saying it. You know, you have a European settler colony taking over a land and abusing the, the tragic, horrific uh, legacy of the Holocaust. Um, and uh, so, yeah, the, the, yeah. Palestinians, uh, they, their bravery, their sense of humor, their art, all of that just blows me away because how do you send your kid to school every day knowing that the, that child is, has to go through a checkpoint possibly, may get shot, often is humiliated, uh, and, and you too as a parent, you are. So that is a very kind of you know, it, it, it puts things into perspective for you and, and you, you, you go sort of like, thank goodness, you know, yeah. this, this, is, this is resistance, you know. And then, of course, alphabet book, you got to put it in. You cannot, <laughs> put it, you cannot not put it in. I don't care that some people will continue to, to uh, associate it with the way it's been portrayed in American mass media because what American mass media can say and do whatever it wants but when you know the truth, uh, you got to tell your truth. You're a scholar. You're an activist. You're an author. Uh, you're an entrepreneur. But you're also uh, a photographer. <laughs> what are you taking pictures of these days? You know, the iPhone has gotten so good that my poor, <laughs> my poor, poor, poor professional camera has been collecting dust. Um, well. In Iran, I take pictures of everything, you know, mosaics on the walls, churches, you know, uh, carpets, food, the, the friends, the books, bookstores, um, and uh, of course my children. And every spring, you know, I, I can't get enough of, of the flowers. Um, I think uh, many people uh, across Asia in particular are crazy about certain types of flowers. So you know how the Japanese will take pictures of the cherry blossom every year as if it's the first time they've seen Absolutely. it, right? I'm, per, I'm very much the same. And I, my mother is the same. Most people I know are the same. So, you know, tulips, <laughs> narcissists. <laughs> uh, and um, that's, that's what, what I mostly do. But um, I, I've done a, a project um, that was a few years ago empowering children and uh, through really dressing up. My daughter was very interested in, in uh, the, the women that I was teaching about. Uh, she was looking at my monitor and she was like, who's this, who's that, who's that? And I said, do you want to know who these women are? So, okay, let's, let's learn about them. And do you want to, should we, she was very little at the time and was willing to do it. So we did a project about how, you know, dressing up as these women and seeing their images and then me talking about 
them with her. And then it got published in a photography journal. And that is some, that, that's, I guess, within photography, that's what I'm most proud about, personally. But the narcissists and the, the tulips, are, they still drive me crazy. You know, uh, signs of life. Yeah. And uh, you uh, continue to be a sign of life, <laughs> abundant life, full life, free life, thank you. courageous life. Thank you. You're for very all of us. Thank uh, you. Goldbarg Bashi, thank you for joining us uh, in Fort Wayne.